Okay, well, I think we should get started. I want to welcome everybody to uh, our cyber lecture this week, Dr. Daniela Schiller in the Department of Psychiatry and Department of Neuroscience. Daniela joined us. Gosh, Daniela, I think it's been almost 10 years now. Yep. Uh, to uh, b initiate her lab, uh, which is focused very much at the interface of basic cognitive neuroscience uh, using humans as an experimental organism along with studies of patients with emotional or psychiatric disturbances. Uh, Daniela has published in the best journals of the field and has really made substantial progress in advancing our understanding of complex cognitive function in humans. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you here uh, to join us today, Daniela, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Eric. Okay, I'll share. Good. Good. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Great. Okay, so um, it's great to be here and to share with you some of the work we did focusing on uh, abstract spaces. Uh, by abstract spaces, uh, we mean uh, how the brain is navigating um, through information that is not uh, immediately accessible uh, in terms of its uh, sensory. Uh, properties. Uh, we refer to mental action, how do we represent the environment and how we can manipulate and quantify these types of representations. What we are uh, familiar with is uh, the studies of conditioned stimuli, for example, that predict important outcomes in the environment and also actions that we learn to perform in order to obtain these rewards. We also know that there's an important relationship between conditioned stimuli and the uh, actions that we perform in terms of affecting our motivational state. Um, for example, uh, an animal model that tries to capture that effect is called Pavlovian to instrumental transfer or PIT. In this model, uh, an animal learns to press a lever to obtain food, for example. And then in a separate session, there's a conditioned cue that becomes associated with the same reward with the food. But the critical situation is that actually in the absence of the food while uh, the animal is pressing the liver to obtain it, in the presence of the conditioned stimuli that signifies the same reward, uh, what it does is enhances the vigorness of their response or the motivational state. So the animal is pressing more vigorously and strongly. It doesn't affect the amount of reward, so it's a reflection um, of that enhancement of vigorness. Uh, we also know a great deal about the neural mechanisms that uh, mediate this process. These involve the dopaminergic uh, stimulations and areas uh, involving the ventral, the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, and its relationships with the prefrontal cortex and also the amygdala. And then uh, there were also studies doing that in humans. In humans, we can think about it like uh, our actions that we do to obtain coffee and then in the presence of a coffee machine or these like little pods, uh, that enhances our vigorness uh, of the actions and we're uh, much more motivated to obtain that coffee, particularly in some hours of the day. Um, so what we see here is that we have the observables, we have the outcomes and we have the actions, but uh, there's a lot of uh, action happening also inside our brains. Uh, that is um, not observable to us. This could include, for example, motor preparation, action simulation, motor imagery, various mental actions. And what we were wondering is whether we can find a way to objectively quantify uh, these processes uh, and even manipulate them uh, because they are a very important aspect uh, of our behavior and interaction with the environment. And we can see that particularly, for example, with rumination, uh, where thoughts are really driving um, our behaviors or leading to relapse in the addiction case. So how would we do that? We tweaked the PIT paradigm and instead of uh, actual instrumental action, we uh, asked the participant to imagine. So we call it Pavlovian to imagine instrumental transfer or PIIT. Um, so here participants, for example, we'll imagine how they throw a ball, do a large movement with a hand, and we would pair that with reward. And we will also uh, 
have them associate a Pavlovian Q re reward, and then test the effect uh, of presenting together that condition Q with their mental imagery. And in this sense, we will test the vigorness uh, of the imagery in the presence of the conditioned stimuli. So how would we do that? Uh, usually what is done in a human study is just asking the participants, you know, uh, trusting them to imagine what we asked them to do. Uh, but we wanted to find an objective way that was the goal of Avi Mendelssohn when he was a postdoc in the lab, now he's faculty at Haifa University. Um, so what Avi did is took advantage of a protocol called real-time fMRI. And what we do here is acquire data from the scanner and analyze it in real time. And when we um, compute a CERN activation, that is our target activation, we can feed back the participants, for example, with reward or any type of uh, outcome that we, we wish to present. Uh, in our case, the way it looked is that participants were instructed to imagine the motor action when they heard the word up and then count backward when they heard the word down. This is a, a control for the cognitive uh, action, especially a sequential one. Um, and what you see here, the different colors are different participants. And you can see that we can identify uh, a specific region that is activated when they imagine the motor action. It's uh, slightly different for each participant, uh, but nevertheless localized uh, in the motor area. And then when we measure two sequential increases from that particular region of, in each individual subject, uh, they will gain a reward, just as, they, just as if they performed um, the correct actual action. Um, so you can see here that that's how it would look. We'll just see the, the ball signal that comes from the fMRI and then give them rewards when we observe this activation in a particular condition uh, versus the control. Then the Pavlovian cue is uh, just classical conditioning. You take two stimuli. One of them is paired with monetary uh, reward and uh, the other is paired with monetary outcome. Uh, and then that's the key. Uh, phase where we will present the stimuli while they perform the imagination. So that's the summary of the protocol. You can see the three stages here. Um, so just to show some results that uh, validate the task. First, we see that um, they do gain rewards when they imagine as, a vor uh, as opposed to counting backwards. Uh, this is what they would get if they uh, got rewards during the counting. So you can see that they nicely uh, perform the action we asked them to do. We also identified a motor uh, imagery network, which is uh, also well identified in previous studies, and we replicate that in our Im imagination task. And uh, of course, they also acquire uh, the correct reward expectancy, expecting to get uh, the money for the gain stimulus versus the loss stimulus. So now what happens when we present these stimuli while they imagine the motor action? This is what I'm presenting here, the data from the motor uh, imagery network. And uh, I'm plotting here activation to the gain trials versus the loss trials. So anything above the diagonal indicates that the activation in that system uh, is higher uh, in the gain versus the loss. And indeed, this is what we see here. This is the invigoration effect or the PIIT effect, just as an animal presses harder on the liver, here their motor imagery is activated activated more strongly. We also looked at the whole brain uh, beyond the motor imagery network. And here we identified uh, a portion of the striatum, which is the caudate nucleus, and uh, in the vicinity of the amygdala, the extended amygdala. And we do see, uh, again, activation that is specific to uh, the gain trial, the gain trials versus the loss trials uh, during the imagery uh, activations. Um, and this is uh, what, what I think is the key finding of that study. Um, I'll walk you through that uh, figure. So what we, what we did here is a correlation between the motor imagery area, the one that we measured the activation from, and the striatum specifically. And this is uh, the x-axis is the trials over time. So this is a, a sliding window. And what you can see that in earlier trials of this transfer test, the correlation between the motor cortex and the stratum is higher uh, 
during the gain trials versus the loss trials. And this is unique to the stratum and not the amygdala. So what does this tell us? It tells us that um, motivational cues can exert this invigorating effect on the neural correlates of mental action that just as they affect real action that we measure. Uh, so we can imagine how uh, this possibly precedes action, maybe also leads to action. Uh, we also see that uh, value and action regions in the brain co-activate or get synchronized when uh, you perform the mental action and the motivational cues are presented at the same time. And we think this could be a protocol to assess uh, processes like relapse, rumination, intrusive thoughts. For example, in addiction, um, if uh, an individual imagines uh, drug-related cues and then, uh, or in imagining that uh, they're taking the drug and then are being exposed to drug-related cues, this might uh, drive them into relapse because of the synchronization between the stratum uh, and the border regions. So we don't show that directly, but the mechanisms we identify suggest that. And about us, uh, in everyday life, it might apply to us too, because uh, we are bombarded with uh, online ads. So if we imagine ourselves driving in a new car and then the image of the car pops out uh, next to our email, it might drive us, it, it might uh, correlate, uh, synchronize and give like a tint of reward to our motor imagery and lead us to assume that this is the action to take. Um, so what that study showed us is that external stimuli can affect our mental action, but this is done passively. We don't have control over it. It just affects us if the stimuli are in the environment while we imagine an action. Um, and in this next study, we asked whether we can deliberately uh, manipulate these uh, mental actions to affect the consequences of the conditioned stimuli. So that's a study that uh, was led by Marianne Redden. Uh, she started it when she was here um, a while ago. You might, some of you might remember her. And now she's a postdoc at Stanford and also in collaboration with Tor Wager, which was her uh, mentor. So what Marianne did is designed a classical conditioning study with auditory cues. Uh, so it was a high tone and a low tone. One of them was paired with a shock, the other wasn't. So CS plus paired with shock, CS minus is the safe. Um, and then we had three groups. One had standard extinction. They just presented with the auditory stimuli without any outcome, outcome which tends to reduce um, the threat response. And um, the manipulation group was the imagined group. What we did is ask them to imagine the cues, imagine the high tone and imagine the low tone was yoked. So exactly in the same order um, of the real extinction process. So they underwent exactly the same thing only in their head. And to control for the general imagination um, impact, uh, then we had another group that just imagined the sounds of birds in the rain. Uh, this group didn't have extinction in some sense. Uh, next, we just gave them unsignaled shocks. This is a, a reinstatement uh, effect that is very good at bringing back a fear response if it's still there, which is what exactly what we measured in the fourth stage when we presented the real stimuli again. Okay, so one group, so all of them learned uh, conditioning, one group imagined, one group had uh, real extinction, one group imagined something irrelevant. Then they were stressed a little bit and what we wanted to see is whether we will identify threat response, the threat response that was, was acquired. If extinction would be successful, we are not gonna identify it here. We should identify it only in the group that didn't undergo extinction. And um, usually what we use in humans are various physiological measure, measures like skin conductance and pupil dilation, heart rate. Um, what we wanted to do here is to um, uh, use a marker in the brain itself. And for this, we used machine learning that will capture the threat signature in the whole brain. Um, the machine learns to classify based on neural activation patterns in the brain that are unique to the CS plus versus the CS minus. Uh, that means that there's a, a brain pattern that represents the presence of the CS plus um, versus the CS minus. So if 
extinction uh, is not successful and the fear memory is still there, we will uh, identify that pattern. And this is exactly what we will look for at the very end when they're presented with the stimuli again. Do they still have the pattern of the brain that represents uh, the meaning of the CS plus versus the CS minus? Uh, this is the threat signature. That's how it looks. Uh, you can see here patterns, for example, these are voxels or the units that we measure in the brain. And uh, this is a prefrontal cortex, uh, various regions that we typically find in other analysis, uh, which are not based on classification and machine learning. This is the amygdala, which we would expect. Uh, so we have a classification accuracy that is pretty decent, and we could tell uh, at that level of accuracy if the brain represents the CS plus versus the CS minus. So uh, we identified the pattern and now let's see whether it is presented uh, at these various groups after the manipulation. And what we found uh, here on the y-axis is the presence of that pattern. And we do identify it uh, in the group that had birds and rain imagination, uh, which um, indicates that they, they didn't undergo extinction. So they still remember the fear uh, stimulus. But the group uh, that did real extinction and imagined extinction don't have that expression. They no longer differentiate the cis plus from the cis minus. And this suggests that imagined extinction was as successful as real extinction. Uh, this was also con consistent with the skin conductance response. Uh, and the skin conductance response was correlated with the expression of the neural uh, signature of threat. Uh, this is just to show it in the amygdala, which is the key region of fear conditioning, uh, just to focus and show that uh, we can identify it in specific regions um, also, and, and not only in the entire brain. Um, so here we can conclude that imagined extinction can effectively uh, diminish both physiological and neural condition responses that were learned. And as I mentioned, we do it deliberately, willingly, um, what it also suggests is that uh, the imagined extinction uh, subjugate takes over the real extinction mechanisms and uh, not alternative mechanisms. Um, so what are the mechanisms that are engaged during the imagination itself? Uh, to probe this, we did a connectivity analysis of the network of regions that are engaged during imagination. This is how we quantify it. We can quantify hubs and centrality of particular regions uh, in terms of uh, how they are centralized in transfer of information in the network. And we can see that the primary hub here is the ventromedial prefrontal cortex uh, that we know is uh, critical for the acquisition of extinction and also the uh, expression and retrieval of extinction memory. This was found in uh, numerous studies in the last few decades. Um, this was found in real extinction. And what we show here is that it's also found in imagined extinction. And the network that is engaged in general imagination is quite different. Uh, actually, it's centered around the nucleus accumbens. So although the networks are unique, uh, they show a great deal of overlap when it's real versus imagined extinction. This is how we can quantify it. Uh, we can see here uh, that the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is um, um, showing centrality of, in the network in both imagined and real extinction. And that's a way to quantify these network properties for other regions. We can also even take activation during extinction and try to predict when uh, extinction will be, uh, which activation indicates that extinction will be successful. And we can do it in overlapping regions for both imagined uh, and real extinction. And these overlapping regions are the VMPFC, the auditory cortex, the sensory region, and the amygdala, but they're also unique uh, areas, as I mentioned, that uniquely will predict the success of extinction. So the conclusion is that we could, in fact, uh, engage imagination to diminish learned threat reactions. And this is probably done by um, engaging both perceptual and learning mechanisms. So the actual mechanisms that are involved in real extinction uh, this is relevant for multiple forms of uh, psychotherapy, which are based on, uh, some of them are based on real exposure, but many of them use uh, imaginary expo exposure, 
uh, scripting of the situations, uh, creating scenarios and uh, modifying them. Here we see that very specific imagination of the actual stimuli uh, is the most, um, at least in the comparison we did here, is effective compared to just general imagination or relaxation. Uh, it could suggest more specific ways to uh, develop for treatment of anxiety and uh, threat. So what I showed so far is um, protocols that are based on associative learning, right? We talked about fear conditioning and instrumental conditioning, uh, which uh, associate specific stimuli in, in the, the environment with action um, and with the outcomes. But the brain is capable also of other forms of learning. Um, this was uh, nicely captured in a seminal review by Edward Tolman in 48. Um, the review describes um, several experiments, which are very curious. And uh, I'll just describe one of them here. An animal was um, required to navigate this narrow corridor, cross the circular arena, go to the narrow corridor again until it get to uh, the food uh, location. So it's a simple learning from the animal because there are no options and animals in the course of a few days learn it very well. They just like go straight. But then uh, after uh, they were familiarized with that uh, path, then something dramatic happened. Uh, one day they go through the narrow corridor, go into the circular arena and boom, it's like sunburst, uh, multiple pathways. Um, so if they were only engaged in the stimulus uh, uh, outcome association, they were, they were supposed to go straight forward. Uh, because this is what they learned. None of the other actions was reinforced in any way. But what happens is, is that the animal kind of visits uh, each of the paths are going a teeny bit, but never, sorry, but never all the way. Uh, but then after a few minutes, the animal goes straight uh, in the path that leads the shortest path uh, to the food. This is pretty remarkable, especially uh, for uh, behavioral neuroscientists at the time because uh, there's no clear associative learning, um, which was unheard of. What the animal did is a shortcut, created a shortcut without learning the shortcut. Um, and this indicated that what the animal learns is other properties of the environment, uh, dimensions and the relationship between the dimensions and forms what uh, he termed the cognitive map um, that um, represents these relationships and the expression of that learning could be found in various situations when uh, these relationships become relevant, such as here when the food was present. Uh, following the discovery of place cells um, in the hippocampus, John O'Keefe and Linda Dell wrote uh, the hippocampus as a cognitive map. Because of this uh, discovery, um, they assumed that the hippocampus is the site where the cognitive map is being formed and represented and that led to decades of studies on uh, spatial navigation um, and um, representation of the physical environment. But what Tolman originally meant, as well as uh, Nadel and O'Keefe in their book, they mentioned that the cognitive map is a general tool for organization of information across multiple domains of life. Wouldn't necessarily be just in the physical space, although that was uh, the focus of decades of research. Until now, uh, in recent years, there have been uh, several very interesting studies showing that there is place-like representation and other properties of navigation in other domains. Uh, there's temporal coding, there's uh, just relationship in arbitrary um, domains, uh, as long as they are relevant for a particular task or skill you need to learn, um, relational learning between different arbitrary properties, uh, also even uh, olfactory space. Um, what we thought is that actually the social world is a pretty good case of navigation. We have uh, various actors or uh, characters in our lives uh, that keep moving in terms of uh, how we interact with them on various dimensions, um, multiple dimensions uh, on which they can map onto. What we thought is that uh, in addition to the mapping of physical space, uh, there will be um, representation of social information. This was shown 
uh, by Nacho Mulanovsky's lab in BATS at the Weizmann Institute. They recorded play cells uh, in the hippocampus of flying, free flying bats. Uh, and then what they showed is that in addition to the representation of the bat's own place, they also found cells that represent the location of another bat that was flying uh, in a path that uh, was relevant to them that they needed to track. Um, so they termed this uh, social place cells where you uh, represent the location of a conspecific uh, however, we wanted to take it one step further and examine navigation in fully abstract space when the dimensions are not directly observed. And in this case, um, we will have to focus on the dimensions of social relationships. This was a study led uh, by Rita Tavares was, um, when she was a postdoc in my lab. And um, to start that investigation, we need to focus on the dimensions of um, social relationships that are most relevant to our psychosocial functioning. And these, based on a, a lot of uh, social psychology theory, are power and affiliation. Uh, these are the most fundamental that uh, we found um, and are observed across species and in various uh, studies and theories. By power and affiliation, we mean something general, a, a cluster of symptoms. We don't commit to, uh, sorry, a cluster of um, traits. Uh, and uh, factors and not a particular word. So affiliation will be something like love, trust, intimacy, warmth, anything that gets you closer or further away. And power will be anything that allows you control or makes you be under uh, with lower control uh, compared to another, to a conspecific. Uh, so the idea is that people will be represented as locations in this two dimensional space. Uh, this means that we have to represent it geometrically and for this, we use polar coordinates, which are um, more convenient than Cartesian uh, coordinates because uh, the reference is moving. And we assume that we are the reference. The movement of the characters are relative to ourselves. But then if we model the relationship as locations in, the, in this space, then we can measure uh, the orientation, the angle, and the distance, the length of a vector between ourselves and other people. So our hypothesis uh, were that the brain keep tracks of social relationship using a two-dimensional representation that is spatial-like or relational, um, and that it would engage the neural system that already evolved to track and compute spatial and relational um, processes and information. And we also assume that uh, it would relate to adaptive function. Our inspiration for it actually came from studying PTSD and trauma and anecdotally, uh, just observing that people who survived and are uh, functional following trauma had, had a pretty good perception of their social environment, uh, acute perception. And uh, you can imagine how understanding the environment, for example, if someone is much stronger than you, even if you're the most inferior, by knowing that it will explain uh, what's happening in the environment and can help you predict, which is important for well-being. So to do that, we developed our role-playing game. Uh, here, we wrote a story. And it's like a choose-your-own-adventure game where you get a narrative and you need to make choices. So the story is that you come to a new city and you need to find a place to stay uh, and find a job. And then characters appear and speak to you. We don't have any spatial information here, just characters and text bubbles. Here, for example, Olivia. Uh, that's the first character you meet and she went with you to high school and then she goes for a hug. Um, and then this is where you have options. You either hug her for a long moment or just give her a brief pat on the back. Uh, and so the story uh, develops with the multiple characters, a pretty nice narrative. Um, and this is the only thing that the participants uh, are doing, engaged in the story, but we can define it as conditions. So we have the narrative condition and we have the options condition. We assume that the coordinates of the location of the other characters are represented here when you make the option. It's like you move uh, a game, uh, like a game dot on a game board uh, from one location to another. So this is where the movement is tracked and this is where the navigation, uh, the movement is happening. So we geometrically modeled this uh, social relationship and participants behavior 
we had the power axis, the affiliation axis, um, participant uh, as the point of view. And then characters would either get closer uh, and lose power, get away. And in each trial, we will have coordinates. And for this, we can make predictions on what would be the activation in the brain. It's what, this is what creates the model that we want to identify in brain activation. Um, so to summarize our approach, uh, you play the game, uh, go through the story, we translate the choices that you make into geometrical um, parameters. And then we examine whether the parameters trial by trial vary uh, uh, just as brain activation is varying. Uh, and, and we assume that this would happen in the hippocampus. The results that we found is that activation in the hippocampus indeed tracked the vector angle. Uh, you can see here that it's unique to the vector angle and the, the different angles that are changing in each trial versus just the narrative or just making an option. It goes higher when, when there's a higher angle. That means that you're usually in the uh, high, that the characters is kind of in the high power, high affiliation area of the game board. Um, the most uh, interesting finding, uh, I think, that got us excited about it is that uh, the degree to which the hippocampus was tracking this movement of the characters correlated uh, with social avoidance and also neuroticism and conscientiousness. For example, the better the tracking, the lower the social avoidance uh, was. Um, that was published, but after that, we did uh, uh, several sets of uh, kind of follow-up uh, studies and analysis of the same data. Uh, we wanted to veer into uh, autism, and we found, for example, here a pretty impressive correlation between only the social subscale of the autism quotient. Uh, and that kind of led us in the direction that now led to uh, collaboration with uh, Jennifer Fosbeg and Shao Sigu. We have a grant together to study uh, this and additional social tasks uh, in autism. As for the distance, uh, that's the other parameter we need. We found that in the posterior cingulate cortex. Uh, again, very unique. This was in the entire brain. It's consistent with previous studies of first impression and updating of impressions. Uh, but here it gives us a specific matrix. Uh, it tells us that it might encode, in particular, the psychological distance that is being represented. Um, so, so far I described, uh, uh, I guess, factors that are um, related to navigation. Uh, it's uh, the orientation and the distance. But what about place itself? If uh, there is a representation of the social environment, we have a social map, then there should be an indication of the place itself, something like a place cell, but that we will find in a neural measure in the human brain. This is uh, an undertaking of uh, Matthew Schaefer, PhD student in my lab, in collaboration with uh, Karen Bucky. This is part of a larger study um, in addiction that we also look at social uh, functioning. So we, we ran the same task, uh, but now we, we have uh, new assumptions, what we, or follow-up assumptions, what we assume is that when characters are closer in the social uh, map, the neural representation of them will be more similar compared to characters that are further apart. So you can see these are completely different people. Uh, and so they will have a different representation, but if they're closer in space, they will be similar because just this aspect is being represented. Um, so for this, we took advantage of a protocol that is called representational similarity analysis. What we take is patterns uh, of uh, like a multi-voxel pattern activation in the hippocampus, and we compare it across trials. And we expect to see that these patterns will be similar for characters that represent, um, for, for characters that are closer in space. This is how it would look like. Uh, these are the trials. We correlate them. Uh, so we're supposed to see high correlation uh, between characters that have um, that are closer versus further away. This is the this is our prediction. Um, and what we will do is compare it to the actual data that we see in the hippocampus, the patterns. So we'll take the correlation between each and every trial. And what we expect is to see high correlation in the patterns 
between trials that represent characters that are closer. I hope that's clear. Uh, but basically the bottom line is that they're supposed to be represented the same way in the brain because they, it's as if they occupy the same location. So they have the same type of representation. Uh, we also have to control for many, many other factors like the character identity. Maybe it's the same character. So of course it will be more similar. Um, so we created uh, all these controls, for example, also for familiarity, for just the slide number, the passage of time. I won't go into that, but just to say that we put all of this uh, in a model and uh, we wanted to see whether accounting for all the variance that is captured by this other explanation, we would still see um, correlation that reflects similarity in the place, in a particular location. And indeed, this is what we found. We had a main sample and we found that relationship in both lateral, uh, sorry, left and right hippocampus. And we also went back to the previous sample, analyzed, did the same analysis and found the same effect. Um, this is unpublished. We're working on it now and uh, we hope it will give compelling evidence that there is representation of location, something like a place representation or place cell-like representation in the human hippocampus. Uh, we compared it also to other models uh, to see that the 2D model is the best explanation, which is what we found. And we also did the whole brain analysis, finding additional regions, but importantly confirming that we also get the hippocampus. Um, so the last thing uh, I'm gonna describe is what uh, additional data we can get from that game, from the geometry of the behavior. This is how it looks like. You see three real individual participants. In the middle is the beginning of the game uh, on the axis of affiliation and power. And the 3D is just the over time. So you see trials uh, evolving. And you can see each trajectory is a character. So you can see the relationship evolving, you know, more toward power affiliation. And what we see is that uh, you can almost see personalities here. Uh, this person has a much wider space, meaning they have different types of relationships. This person have a very narrow space that yeah, it means that there's very low consistency in the relationships uh, going back and forth, but also quite similar across all the characters. Um, so we're wondering if we, if we quantify these parameters, maybe we can develop a diagnostic tool, possibly even um, a treatment tool by having participants trained to think spatially about their relationships. Uh, one such uh, measure that we, um, now are looking at, but we're looking at additional measures, is the consistency that I mentioned. This is a 2D representation of the task. So characters here are moving along as the game progresses. And if a person is consistent, for example, they started getting close to a character and continue to do so, or they gave power to a character and continue to do so and so forth, you will end up with a pretty large area uh, of that space, as opposed to if you're going back and forth and uh, we can um, calculate that and create a measure for each participant. In our healthy initial cohort, we found a negative relationship with social avoidance. So the more consistent you were, the less socially avoidant you were. But we're unclear that uh, indeed, this is how you wanna be all the time because you do need some flexibility. So sometimes you'll be consistent, but you should be able to update. Um, and uh, based on, on incoming information, kind of shape your relationships as they go. So we assume there's a, probably a sweet spot and we went to the more extreme, extreme cases of uh, avoidant personality disorder and borderline personality disorder. Uh, this was in collaboration with Harold Konigsberg. And we also have actually a grant now to study that um, with Harold and Chausey Gu. So the, the preliminary findings that we have are that avoidant personality here in the heat mat you see are kind of uh, centered in, the, in one quadrant of the area, giving power to most participants. Whereas borderlines are kind of going back and forth, their, their region, their area is pretty narrow and the healthy controls are somewhere in between. That's just the very beginning. We develop additional measures. Um, but overall, what we find is that maybe these um, metaphors that we use when you talk about social interactions are 
uh, more than metaphor. We don't just have a tight social circle or someone is uh, beneath uh, you or something like that. Maybe it represents the actual computation of that information in the brain. Um, it extends the social domain into the variety of cognitive maps that the hippocampus is representing and mostly points to the hippocampus as a uh, somewhat of a novel target uh, for maladaptive social behavior across psychiatric populations. Uh, and as I mentioned, I mentioned some of the populations, we have a lot of collaborations. We are also working now on PTSD uh, with Adriana Feder and Mercedes Perez and so forth. So uh, we're hoping to get much more data. We also went into the online domain uh, with uh, the Sinai App Lab and as part of our projects in the, the new Center for Computational Psychiatry, we developed a social brand app where we, now we have two tasks, uh, the social game and um, Shaus's uh, game that we're using in addition to various surveys. For example, if you play the game, this is how it would look like on your iPhone. You go into this journey in a new city and you interact with the characters. Um, so we're gonna launch that very soon and we hope to develop an app that will consist of multiple tasks to study various measures. So that's it. Uh, to summarize, I showed you how we build on animal models of emotional learning and extend them into mental action that is uh, not observable or less manipulated uh, in the animals and but very relevant and unique to the human brain and how we might induce emotional change with that. And also how we think now about the hippocampus as uh, mapping social interactions. And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. This is my lab and collaborators and funding. Thank you. Fantastic, Daniela. That was really a beautiful uh, presentation. If you could unshare your screen, please. Uh, sure. and, uh, and we have plenty of time for discussion, so people should feel free to uh, unmute themselves and ask away. Kai, do you have a question? I do. Hey, Daniela, that was a great talk. Um, so to what extent does the role of the hippocampus depend on the choice behavior that is allowing the subjects to make their own choices about the outcome of each interaction? So in other words, if you um, had them read the same narratives, but you didn't give them two choices, you just said, and then you hug for a moment, and then you do this, and then you do this. Do you get the same kind of, um, does, the, does the hippocampus work in the same way? And, and, and likewise, if you were to have somebody read a narrative about um, someone else sort of uh, having these interactions, is it just sort of a a generalized social space or is it something specific to you and then what is the role of choice in generating that that map yeah thank you for this uh, question it's actually a very critical point about the task and what we were trying to capture um, we didn't manipulate that specifically uh, in that task but um, taking from previous studies that didn't use this actual choice but presented social narratives these studies usually identify uh, mostly the prefrontal cortex, media prefrontal cortex, uh, because it engages uh, in processing of social information. And what we think is that only with choice, you create movement in the space. And this is what engages the navigational computation. So uh, in my view, it's critical that there will be a choice. Uh, and this is the same as you would look at a map as opposed to actually walking in space. Uh, which I think looking at the map wouldn't always engage uh, the hippocampus or play cells. Um, yeah. Great, Roger, did you have a question? Okay, I see that you uh, put your video on, I was wondering. Anybody else have questions? Sure, I'd love to talk about a lot of things. <laughs> Go ahead, Allison. What an exciting line of research. Um, and um, so I'm. I'm maybe gonna limit. I'm maybe gonna limit to three questions. <laughs> One's a technical question. Can you remind me how you operationalized power and affiliation in the game? Like, how did you um, represent that in the game, and how was it varied? Yeah, uh, indeed, I didn't mention that. Uh, 
so the way we manipulated it is for power, we created uh, uh, scenarios and sentences where there was an imperative. Uh, I ordered you to do something or someone else ordered uh, you to do something. For example, uh, go ahead, take this seat. And if you comply or not, that moved the power. And for affiliation, we included interactions that involved sharing of personal information and uh, physical touch. Uh, for example, that hug, uh, go for a hug, that was an affiliation interaction. Um, yep. So is there also a sort of approach avoid dimension happening there? Um, one is forging and one is... Well, in terms of which direction you take, Right, isn't, aren't those two, uh, aren't those ways of defining those two constructs also, could we also describe that as the animal forges, the animal approaches? Yeah. Versus? Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's consistent with that, uh, definitely. So they approach or avoid. The novelty here is that you frame it in two dimensions. Because um, approach or avoidance are typically Friend is a one dimension, you know, you yeah, look at exactly. polar. Mm -hmm. And here we have the interaction between power and affiliation that appears to be important in terms of uh, how the brain is computing that information. Um, uh, really interested in applying the first quarter of your work to uh, imaginal exposure in OCD. And I wonder if you've had a chance to, to look at some of your tools in that population. Um, no, not yet in clinical population, uh, but I would love to. I think it's... Uh... I, would, I would love to do that too, because we have a hunch, especially in our treatment-resistant OCD population that are undergoing DBS, we have a hunch that there is, this is not an extreme learning disability, or this is not an extreme stuckedness, but there's something fundamentally altered in their circuitry. And really, the only way to figure that out would be something like you did, where the the latent or the hidden um, mechanisms in between A and Z are, are somehow parameterized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly what we were going for. So uh, I would love to work on that. And finally, in your imagined action, I noticed you didn't have a role for the ACC. And in our, but in our urge to tick in Tourette model, the ACC is such an important mediator before, between the swelling, um, interoceptive distress, or um, imagined uh, need for action, the valuation of that action, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, and then the tipping point into the motor action really hinges, appears to hinge on that ACC activation. So I was surprised it was not in your model. Uh, you mean the, when we, it might be actually in the motor imagery network. Um, I can go back and look at the data, but I think there was uh, like at least dorsal ACC or pre-SMA kind of area um, that was part of that network. So I, I can look at that and uh, uh, see see if it's relevant. But wasn't a really central node in your in your thinking there? Um, no, I mean we. In the motor, when they imagine, you mean when they imagine the motor action, right? Yeah, and in particular, this correlation and anti-correlation yeah. that you saw, I think you said with striatal regions? Yeah, yeah, you're right. We didn't do the correlation with the, with the motor. It's something uh, with the other motor region. Actually, just we just compared between the striatum and the amygdala. Uh, so it, it's worth looking at. Yeah, I agree. I would think that would be pretty cool because we see that crossover correlation with the ACC in a couple of really interesting scenarios, like, like when, when cold sensation goes from just tracking the, the, the temperature of the cold um, to when the brain starts to perceive it as painful mm -hmm. to when the hand gets pulled away from the, the, the cold object, right? It seems to be like the, the correlation, the, um, yeah. the moment when those correlations hit is the moment where they pull their hand away. Oh, nice. I, I want to talk with you more about it. I could be totally wrong in making these associations, but 
Uh, it's very exciting to think about while you were presenting. Yeah, yeah. It, it's super interesting. Uh, I think the most exciting thing is, is to see activation in the motor cortex with the absence of action. Uh, so that, that opens to you know, many in interesting questions. Questions from other people? While we're waiting, Daniela, let me ask you a couple myself. So uh, car carrying on what Allison had just mentioned, you talked about identifying other brain areas, and I wondered if you looked at all voxels in the brain in an agnostic way with machine learning to identify any region that might be related to some of the tasks that you have. Yes, um, uh, essentially in all of them. So we always do the whole brain analysis. Fantastic. Yes, the, the last one, especially like in the social space, Yes. That was a whole brain analysis, and these are the region we found. So it wasn't uh, region um, specific. It, it was what came out from the whole brain. Right. No, that's, so that's fantastic. And then related to that, the social um, interaction styles and related app that you developed uh, with Xiaosi, you know, I'm thinking that it would be interesting to study a whole range of psychiatric populations with those tasks and associated brain imaging. Uh, you know, it could be a, um, an added on tool for the, for our doc, essentially, you know, providing a much uh, more granular information about social cognition across diagnoses in a trans diagnostic manner. Yeah, absolutely. We got an R21 to develop that. It's like we're just ending the project. Uh, and that was exactly the purpose. It's exactly what they funded for to create this app. Um, and as I mentioned, it's running at Sinai. It's just so exciting, the collaborations we have. So it's a borderline autism, PTSD, addiction, schizophrenia. Uh, we, I think we can definitely do something like a center grant or something. We can talk about it, but there's a lot of work now and many collaborations around these questions. Yeah, no, it's, it's such a creative, innovative work, really. Uh, Thanks for a great talk. Uh, we still have a few minutes if people want to unmute themselves and ask questions. Okay, well, I guess not. Daniela, thank you again very much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Have a good rest of the week and weekend. And uh, stay tuned for our next uh, cyber lecture and translational neuroscience seminar speakers. Thank you very much. Bye, Daniela.